today, we are very happy to be able to collaborate with Spurs Gallery uh, in Beijing, uh, Sherry Lai and her team, um, to put out this uh, very interesting program that has to do with um, art education and practice. Um, this actually also goes well as uh, a first time collaboration between Spurs Gallery and the Yale School of Art uh, Masters of Fine Arts program in painting and printmaking. Am I, did I have it right? Perfect. So I really do hope that this would be a long time collaboration and that we would be able to have at least uh, programming like these um, every year yes. and conversations such as these. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Sherry Lai, uh, partner at Spurs um, Gallery, to introduce some of our, uh, to introduce all of our panelists. I'll quickly um, name them for you. Um, Hans Holtzwerp. Holtzbot. Yeah. <laughs> Tula Tira Oliveira, who is a Yale School of Art graduate. Uh, Li Wei Yi, uh, Wei Yi Li, also a Yale School of Art graduate, and Han Hien uh, all artists. And um, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry Lai, and I'm the partner of Spurs Gallery. Thank you all for joining us here today. Um, we will have time for uh, questions at the end of the panel. And um, I will begin introducing our speakers today. Um, so our first speaker, Tara uh, Oliveira, she was born in Fall River, USA. Um, she received her BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2013 and an MFA from the Yale School of Art this year. Uh, Tara is a multidisciplinary artist whose work spans textiles, sculpture, installation, and performance. Um, she uses a dual language of craft and science fiction to center marginalized visual culture, including that of the queer communities and Latinist leftist political movements. Tura has had solo exhibitions at the Gary Contemporary, La Mama Galleria, uh, Brick, Way Hill, these are all New York, and the solo booth at the 2023 mm -hmm. Material Art Fair in Mexico City. And our second uh, speaker, a Yale alumni, Wei Yi Li. Uh, she was born in Changsha, China in 1987. She received uh, a BA from the College of Architecture and Urban Planning in Tongji University in 2009, an MFA from the Yale School of Art in 2012, and a PhD from the Royal College of Art in 2023. Much of her work has been influenced by her decade-long career as a designer and also an image maker. Um, she has reflected on the question of how we, as uh, creators, can continue to create in a world dominated by increasingly similar digital image tools and fabrications. Um, our third speaker and also an artist, uh, Tan Tian, um, he received his BFA from the Kingston University in London um, and his MFA from Hunter College in 2019. He's now a teacher teaching the undergrads at the CAFA in Beijing. And uh, through his works, uh, Mr. Tan tries to um, you know, show the viewers the parts of things that they expect, those that they ignore, and those they tend to you know, overlook and avoid at all times. Um, and our last speaker, uh, Mr. Hans Werner Holtzweth, uh, is a book designer and editor based in Berlin. He, uh, in 1993, became a freelance art director for the publisher Scalo. Um, and in 2000, he funded his own imprint, the Holtzworth Publication, to work with uh, contemporary artist books and exhibition catalogs for galleries. Um, the most you know, recent imprints published um, working with our gallery are uh, Li Nu and Zimbrila. I think those are circling around in the room. Um, and Mr. Holtzworth has also been editing oversized monographs and limit art editions you know, for, for Taoshin, collaborating with the most world-renowned uh, artists such as Jeff Koons, Dave Hockney, to name some. Tools. <laughs> That's okay. Don't make too much noise. All right. So I'm going to start with Tura. I'm going to uh, begin with you by asking you some questions. Um, so Tura, can you you know tell us a little bit about you know your area of focus? Um, you know what brought you to Yale, and um, you know because we all know the selectivity and the rigorous program in Yale can be you know um, very tough and. Um, um, we wanted to know, you know, how this exhibition you know, came to place and, you know, a little insight 
insight from you representing the class here in Beijing? Yeah, so I, as they with Sherry, thank you for the introduction, it was very thorough. Um, I went to the Red School of Design um, and I graduated in 2013. And then I was in New York for a while showing and, and making work. And then I kind of, I got to a point and was researching uh, graduate schools and, and Yale was always the top of my list because partially because of its relationship and like very long standing relationship with the New York art scene, but also because of its history as a textile artist and somebody who works, you know, sort of between fine art and also craft. Um, the history that the school has with like Joseph and Annie Albers was really important to me. Um, and it's a pretty unique, it, it holds a pretty unique position sort of like the history of the relationship between fine art and craft um, in terms of education in the United States. Is that like Yale is where Joseph Albers went after like I think Black Mountain. Um, and so how is it sort of like my path to Yale and then the path to doing the show was that, uh, you know, Sherry reached out to our class and we, you know, Sherry started, I think, maybe like May of this, or March. Yeah, it was during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or it was like a right after sort of like restrictions had been lifted um, in terms of like uh, being able to visit, you know, being able to visit China. And so we, you know, we began speaking with, with Sherry and we organized the show and it's, I don't know, it's really special to have like been working with all of my classmates for, you know, two years now at this point. In fact, about half of the class, like I applied to the school at the beginning of 2020 and about half of us um, actually deferred. And so some of these students, people I've known for three years now at this point. And so we all know each other's work really well and putting the show together, I don't know, it feels really special that, especially that, you know, it this work has traveled literally around the world <laughs> to, to get here and then to have this kind of a, a conversation and relationship with, um, you know, the contemporary art scene right now, uh, in Beijing specifically with you know us as artists who are very much emerging. Like you know, we, we just graduated from graduate school. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your practice? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I'm primarily uh, a textile artist. I have to work with metals, um, and my work it deals a lot with, you know, science fiction ideas of sort of um, like the monster, what I would call like the monstrous feminine and working primarily with uh, quilting as a as an art form, particularly as like not only a very like uh, American folk art form, but also this art form that's extremely universal and that is like, I would say maybe, you know, the only sort of medium that's maybe more universal than quilting is, is ceramics. Um, and so I, you know, use hand dyed silk uh, in many different forms to create sculptures and quilts and installations. Um, and also, you know, I, the area that I grew up in is sort of has a long history of textile production. And my father growing up was a steel worker. And so for me, having pieces that blend, um, you know, cast and hand worked metal, um, and then also you know, silk and quilted silk has this sort of relationship both to gender and also to sort of my family history and the history of, um, you know, sort of like factories and factory workers in the part of the U.S. that I grew up in. Thank you. And I know as a class, I think um, I remember when we discussed about the exhibition, <coughs> you guys had a really fun, you know, naming the exhibition, you know, contest um, per se. You know, do you want to tell us a little bit about you know how that came about and you know who won and oh, what happened? Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> we had we had basically this thesis class that we would meet every other week, um, and we had one thesis class with kind of like a knockdown drag out, like we are narrowing down you know our list of titles, um, you know, down to I think like five mm -hmm. um, to present to you and. Uh, a breath on glass was was Brian Brian Luis Sanchez, who's one of my classmates, and who has this like beautiful self portrait in the show at Spurs. Um, this was his title, and this was like he held on to it for and like really, really, really made the case for this title. <laughs> and then when we presented Sherry with, I think we narrowed it down to like a list of three to send to you. Or five, five or six. Three, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know there was this sort of like long period of time where Sherry, I believe you messaged me and you were like there's one of these that really speaks to me. And then of course with like the time difference between um, the East Coast of the US right. and Beijing, there was sort of like, 
I think you sent that message, and then we were like on the edge of our seat, being like, oh my god, which one really spoke to Sherry? And then it was Brian was really excited. <laughs> I think it's a really it's a really good time over the yeah. last yeah. yeah. Thank you, um, Wei. Um, I was wondering since you graduated from you know Yale. Uh, in 2012, a long time ago, and uh, each of your educational background are very different. You know, can you please tell us a little bit about you know why you transfer from architecture per se to Yale to study graphic design, and then also you went to UK to study for a doctorate and RA. You know, how did you decide on becoming a professional artist throughout these educational choices? Well, to be honest, I I I, I don't think I shift my direction in the back in the education process. Um, for example, like when I uh, when I was at um, Tokyo University, the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, my pathway was visual communi communication, so it's design. And when I was at Yale, I was graphic designer. That means like for painting people, photography people, I'm someone who will make posters, books, catalogs, website for guys, <laughs> and it's also about design. So then I. I went to UK and I got my doing my PhD in Royal College of Art and my major is uh, innovation design engineering, as well, which is also design. So I think like um, normally people will ask me another related question, like why do you spend on so much time on learning design? Because <laughs> it sounds like a very very practical thing. Like it seems like only very bad designer will like. Oh, only learning design <laughs> instead of doing it. <laughs> but I think, like, for me, the question is super clear and simple because design is about how people make things. And um, if you do research in design, you're actually learning how people can make things. And you can get patterns when you're learning from these patterns. You can you just understand who we are as human beings. So that's simple. And um, so the, for the second question, uh, why I choose to be an artist, professional artist? I mean, throughout the process. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So for this question, I think I, I didn't choose to be a designer. I, um, I think the starting point is like, um, when I was still a, a design student, I loved to make those tiny little things, such as my, my jewelry or tiny objects and then post them online and then some curators, galleries will find me on my social networks site and they text message me say um, do you do you want to show a piece in a gallery space? So that's how this thing is beginning. So I would say like, like I do not decide to be, I do not make the choice to be an artist. I am the chosen one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's the answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Tantia, I know that um, you um, took, you know, first year undergrad in the UK, and um, when you returned to China, it was very unusual and unique that um, you went to work in a gallery. Um, to learn about the art industry in China, and then you went to the States to, to, to for grad school. And um, I mean, both of your degrees are in fine arts, but um, you know, when did you decide, the same question that goes to Wei Yi was, when did you decide to become a professional artist? Because, um, you know, for a gallerist like me, it really intrigues when people, you know, the artists decide to work uh, in a gallery. It's uh, very, you know, threatening for <laughs> So, yeah. Uh. <coughs> To be honest, uh, I haven't decided to become a professional artist yet because I think I'm a, I am a teacher right now and uh, how to say <laughs> I am a teacher right now and uh, like uh, being a teacher is actually my dream job for them than uh, being an artist and uh, to me being a good teacher is not only like it's not about how you taught the student in the classroom. It's also about what you do, um, like the, as a sample to the student. Uh, so that's the reason why I want to have shows, why I want to be part of uh, in the art world. Uh, so just to show my student that I am not only good at criticize them. <laughs> that's so that's what we Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about um, you know what kind of courses that you're teaching at Kafa right now? You know what 
your students, your teaching, you know, what kind of discipline, um, area of focus? Um, so you've been in Alpha for, for quite some years. Yeah, I'm teaching a lot of talks, but I mean, like, for example, yesterday, I take all my students to IKEA and uh, to ask them to feel the IKEA vibe and uh, to make them compare this kind of all the products around them and uh, compare that to the gallery. Like, what's the difference between that? So that's actually my class, yesterday class. <laughs> I mean, like, but I, I think you, you asked me about the, 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 the working in the gallery, the yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I think like that's like really helpful uh, because that's the, the experience that I used to work in the gallery helped me a lot to understand what a gallery wants from the artist mm -hmm. and also as an artist what, what, what I don't want and uh, how far I can push this line but still can represent by a gallery. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, oh, Hans, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit on your um, practice as you know, a renowned art publisher, and um, because you work with so many artists, you know, both mm -hmm. in Germany and abroad, and you know, recently China a lot, um, you know, which of them do you find that has most interesting art educational backgrounds, or even so, like, art educational background in general that shaped them to become a professional artist, you know, through your, um, you know, interactions with them, or, you know, some yeah. Um, how to start? Uh, I'm, let's say just a little bit as a background. I, I learned photography and then I studied graphic design. I studied photography, then graphic design. And uh, I always was interesting in, in, in the short story because otherwise we are really, we are before the computer started to be in our world. Um, I really wanted always to do editorial. Uh, so uh, that has to do with photography, but also like in general, like how images goes together. It's a discussion about the workflow, what one image does to the other image. And that's what you're basically doing in the book. But at the end, as a designer or like more like a typographer, I'm a translator of the material I'm given, but I'm not a translator in a just like one-to-one -one translation because I have to make an interpretation uh, and nail it down so the audience is understanding what the artist's approach is to the world, his depiction of the world. And over the year, um, in the beginning, I was mainly working with my peer group, like Christopher Wuhl, Albert Oehlen, uh, Jeff Kuhn, so they're all my age, so you know where we are, but in which generation we are talking about. <laughs> it's really before the computer came up. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, it, this was very close because when I was studying, studying was the idea of a free space. Uh, and compared to now, I was always saying to myself, before I'm 30, I'm not starting to work. I'm just doing things. And uh, but of course, I was working. I was working in the photo studio. I was working in the design studio. I became partner with 31 of a big design studio. So. I, but I'm really in this kind of very profound classical corporate designer. So already before I did books, I had this kind of career as a corporate designer mm -hmm. uh, in a very typography orientated way. But I was always looking, looking, looking. And uh, accident is a, is a nice word because you're always looking for the accident. So I had the luck in the 90s uh, to meet Carlo Walter Keller and uh, we created a new photography book and also kind of a new approach to work with photographers. And in this case, I could work with all my heroes. I did uh, Robert Frank, I did Larry Clark, I did Nan Golding, all the things when I was studying photography. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And then he's in the same age as me, but you know, it's a little bit like a similar thing. But so it was a good starting point uh, to go into their work, meet them, talk to them. Uh, and getting more and more uh, into the photography history, but from my study I was in the photography history, I was totally in. Art history was parallel world. Um, so, uh, and this was like another discussion with reality. Also like with working with the photographers is always a, a question about reality, 
the mirroring the world and how you put it in the book, which means if you have white space, then it's a poem. If you have like bleeding, then you are in the world. So and that's what you basically the borders you are dealing with the world. Uh, but at a certain point, it was too much reality discussion for myself. As I, I didn't want it always like, oh, this photo was taken in this moment. It was so important. It was the best world. This, I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I, I really like to be more in the world of creation. And not, that doesn't mean that photography is not creation, but it's another. Photography means you are having a kind of a relationship with the world you are taking. Uh, while with art, you are in another media world. Because otherwise, uh, photography wouldn't be the media photography if you're not having this connection. Uh, and from there, um, yeah, then it started with the first book with Christopher Wool, which was an exhibition catalog for the Museum of Modern Art in, the, I think, 97. And from there, I turned more and more over into uh, doing art books. That doesn't mean that photography books aren't art books. And so in the beginning, uh, I started like saying, Studying was, for us, free space. It was the time of punk. It was the time of the using all the materials. You don't have to be educated. It's like the dilettantes. You're just like doing something. Uh, and uh, it was more like, you didn't know, they are the punks. They are also coming from the university. But it was more about the, the behavior to the material, to the uneducational point. And also, you want to cut off the narration from the history. Um, he had then the, the painters coming up, painting him up again, and uh, so when I'm looking, this peer group, Jeff Kuhn studied, but Christopher Wool never really studied, but I'd say he's related to a kind of studying. Then he was assistant to an artist, so they all have a kind of connection. But what's all the thing is, they wanted to do it early on. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best story which described it is a little bit like I heard about the Rolling Stones. They just, they didn't know in the beginning to play, but they heard like thousands of records and they just tried to find the sound. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned with whatever, Christopher Wool, Albert, they just working and then there was a moment when they said, okay, that's my body of work. Mm -hmm. It's totally different like when I'm looking at the older artists like uh, David Hockney or, or Baselitz because they have a totally different educational uh, history. And these are artists, they are like, David Hockney is for me the most kind of amazing person because from early on, even with 12, 13, he was drawing all the time. It's always get it better, look harder, look closer, yeah, like, do it. And then the teacher said, no, it's not good, do it again, just do it. And then. Like these stories, and when you look at his history, like early, the early drawings are amazing. And like the best story he was saying, oh, from the school we had to go out in, in, in today's life uh, and take, draw a picture with three people in. Oh, I went to the laundry and I painted five. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that means this, they wanted, yeah? And it's similar to Baselitz, so that, uh, but, but they were both went so classical kind of art education, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely at a different time. As a, it, it, I'm just a generation later, and for us, uh, studying was a free space to create, to find something, to make experiments. When I, I did briefly a, a teaching, but in design, and I was surprised how many, how less ex experimental things happening, because we were in the school, but it was more outside the school. It was like, meeting artists, going to exhibitions. But it was a different time. There was, when we got a book from Abrams about one artist, it was one book about this artist. Now we have 10 books about this artist, yeah? So, but from, from the experience, they all wanted it deeply to do it. And they're always looking for and finding their voice. So that's maybe art gets the kind of big Bow back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you wanted to comment on, you know. No, no. <laughs> you know because you also did a lot, you know, graphic design, you know, designing. So when Hans was mentioning about, you know, the practice and making the Actually, I'm thinking about, like, I think is there is a natural link between photographer and graphic designer. Because sometimes I feel like, as a designer, I have this experience if I make a book for a painter or make a book for a photographer. 
photographer is always that one who is really demanding, can I use the word? <laughs> you, you just want someone to, I don't know, a practitioner who can put the thing at the place you want. Sometimes, and sometimes I, I always say, it's, it's, it's where a lot of my photographer friends who finally become a graphic designer because it's, it seems like, I don't know, you, you, you can tell me if it's true. Like, I always think photographer law have this urge of having a photo book, but I don't think pen, panders have the same urge. <laughs> I don't know, every, every photographer law have a beautiful catalogs or photo books. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think so, but it has to. It has a lot to do that uh, photographers' practice or like what they are looking for is often much more told in an editorial or like in in, in a story. So the books often translates the works better because what the what the book is doing. Uh, First of all, you get this narration. You get the kind of it, turning the page makes like one to the other. It's different to the wall because the wall you are the one who's walking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it it's a, it's a makes a, a totally other different interaction because you have no cut in between. It's uh, yeah. So, but it, it's it's you how are you approaching the work or what's happening in the book? And the the thing is, as so I I grow up in in the, with all about the context discussion. As in the eighties was all about context, how like phrasing and picture. What does a, 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 an underline or a, 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 a caption means to the picture? What how does the caption translate the picture to something? And that's also what's happening in the book. So with the selection in the book, you can make. A statement, and often if you, uh, as a, it's different if you're doing portraits, but a lot of they are doing. I, I don't like when you, when you say like Boris Michalov doing uh, uh, social reportaging on Ukraine. Of course, it's always this attempt to the reality, the moment. But at the end, the artist like Boris Michalov takes it in his reality. And by cutting and cropping, he also using artistic, historic, like uh, like um, uh, iconographic, uh, religious thing to make them much more than just the reality. Or uh, he's when he's using uh, the poor people and they are becoming like nude standing and becoming a kind of a dignity. So there's another interaction which, in the single image, wouldn't tell by its own. So that's why a, a, a photo book makes photography so interesting. Uh, and the, the classical photo books are artworks, uh, so they are artworks right. by its own. Because, like Robert Frank, the Americans, it's only told in the American, and it's it's told in this way that the original one shows the photographs very small, like poetic thing. So it's a little like a poetic book about America, and you just go through. And the first. The first edition of this book was even with a drawing on the outside. There was not, I did once a new cover with a flag. But uh, in the beginning it was just a really little small poetical book about America. And it was this kind of poetic approach of Robert Frank to the world, mm -hmm. which he then later did with a lot of um, collages, handwritings and things. So it's, and so that's why I'm saying, oh, Tulsa. Tulsa is just like Larry Clark, it's like tough to the life. Sexual independence for Dan Golden, it's only this moment of New York. Also, sorry, it's now a lot of name dropping again, but this is why I think photography is always, a, a book is a good place for photography because it becomes the work by its own. Yeah. I understand because, like, um, I feel that, like, we, people have this history of how, how you said, like, uh, Family album or any kind of album when you travel or something is always something that's it by itself. And when you do this, you're actually not only documenting, you just try to try to analyze it, you organize it, and finally it becomes something. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I think so. Anyway, thank you for sharing uh, this. And um, I want to just loop back, you know, on our art education to Torah, um, that you know, because I know out of at all the three artists here, you're the you know just graduating, and um, I also wanted to ask about, you know, your plans after graduations, you know, some of the, the plans, because I know, for instance, you know, Tanya's teaching, ways of professional artists, you know, what are some of the plans of the class? Um, do people go to residencies, people are about teaching, or, you know, 
Yeah, I think maybe I'll cover like what sort of broadly what people and uh, people, you know, students who are in the show, actors, a sort of whatever he's doing. A lot of people are just, like stay in New Haven for the first year. Um, I'll, several students are teaching uh, at the University of Hartford or other, you know, smaller uh, colleges and universities in Connecticut. You know, sort of commuting from New Haven. Um, I try to think. Most people are staying in sort of like New York, New Haven-ish area and teaching, working, showing work. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody. Nobody, I think most people are sort of staying in the like general sort of tri-state area. Mm -hmm. um, I am doing kind of a weird thing, which is that, so I've moved back to New York, which is where I was before school, um, and I have a couple projects going on there in terms of showing work. I'm working on a, um, a public art commission uh, with the New York Public Schools, which is really exciting. It's first of all, it's going to open in 2026. So it's a very long, it's a really long process, which is fine with me. Um, but also, I've just kind of before leaving to come here, I've like packed up my life uh, in a big way, and I'm going to be going to a residency in Rome for a year, which is I think something I've never done before. It's uh, I'm really excited. <laughs> um, and I'm so I'm going to be showing work while I'm there, and uh, yeah, just going to be studying in Rome and, and showing work like having my studio there. Um, and yeah, I just finished up a partnership with the Living Room Museum um, in New York uh, in June. And then yeah, but for the most part, students are showing work in in California. I have, there are two students who are going to be showing. Um, we're going to be showing work together um, in Taiwan and. Um, yeah, I think people are, are really like the, the yeah, place. absolutely all over the place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, and then just going back to Tatian, you know, because Tura was sharing on how a lot of their class uh, they see are going abroad, or they're mm -hmm. doing residencies, or also some of them are, I know, are going back to like, for instance, like RISD, or staying in Yale to teach. Um, you know, do you think, for instance, like your, uh, you know, two degrees in art, you know, kind of really aids you, you know, nowadays that you our teachers, since you're saying teaching has always been, you know, your first priority. Um. Mm, my answer is like no. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I guess you you were explaining. I say yes, but no. I mean, learning art in U.S. and the teaching art under the system is just two different things, and. I mean, like when I was studying in U.S., I like to talk with my friend, and we talk about identity, talk about gender, we talk about politics, we talk about philosophy, and then like we talk about all those things, how that relates to my work, and then I do the work, and then I we talk, and then I do the work. Like I like this kind of. I really enjoy this kind of experience. But when I come back and start the teaching, um, all I do is I was trying my best to redesign the class to keep my students still interested in contemporary art. You know, like I have a class, like I was going and asked them the first question is like how many of you guys want to be an artist in the future? And um, I guess like there are 20 of them, and there's only one student that she might want me. And uh, this, like, uh, it's our school, right? And uh, the rest of the students are really just really happy that they finally get rid of the high school and move on to their next uh, stage, uh, kind of like a really popular school. And so, I guess no. I mean, like uh, teaching and learning, are, like is different, and uh, China and U.S. are different, and uh, the world of art is different in these two places. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the difference does definitely exist. Um, okay. I'm going to go back to Hans now. Oh, that's not the most difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I guess what I wanted to ask is that also, you know, out of personal curiosity too, um, because you work with a lot of artists, you know, in our gallery as well, and in China, and you, the, you know, the you know Chinese industry, the artistry very well, I would say, you know, and what are your perceptions on, you know, just kind of like also looking back to kind of like Kantian's answer to education and how he's teaching, and um, I mean, your perception on the emerging artists, uh, the art scene in China now. I said it's a very difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I just feel me more like a volunteer when I'm doing things. So it's a, uh, uh, and of course I'm here since years and I'm coming two times a year, but I, I wouldn't, as, as I'm a, I would call me, I'm a bookmaker. So I'm uh, not a researcher as a curator or like uh, trying to collect or like, Oh, I want to have the new blue chip and buy it and then can sell it. Also, it's a totally I different uh, story. So for me, it's always like, oh, how how I react, what I have to learn, do I understand it? And uh, and so in the first time when I came to China to understand this kind of non-European understanding of high art uh, was a big step. Also that in a way, art and craft is the same thing than art. As I, in a similar yeah? so, and coming back with this overloaded uh, European history, which is a religious history, it comes from Greek history, going back now to democracy. So it's really going from kind of rural things to today's society, but it's so linked. Also, the, the historical development is a social development at the same time, and the imagery has a clearly relationship. And to to see the first time or to understand and learn the first time that here the mountains are large and the human being is small. It's a huge step. It's a, it's a totally different perception of the world than we have. In the beginning it was the Maria was big and there was no nature. Till we discovered the nature, it was in the 15th, 16th century after. So, that we have a totally different. So from this point of view, I'm st still like saying, "Oh, I have to understand. Oh, okay, this is this is a different culture." That's that's why I like to come to China. It's a little bit like why I really like to go to the U.S. so often, mm -hmm. because even from Europe, we seem to be close, but we are not close. The rituals in the U.S. are totally different. You are really talk differently. Germany is rude in some kind of ways. America is always, oh, thanks a lot, it's so nice, oh, wow. That's, or like in LA, then it's even, oh, it's marvelous, it's wonderful. I, 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 even getting lunch takes you 15 minutes because you have to talk. In Berlin, it's, oh, I just want to have this role. Yeah. You know, really? Get it. So, and, uh, so it's that thing what I like. Yeah? It's so this kind of daily things in relation then to understand. The, the other thing, um, to the emerging young scene, for me, often, you know, I think art relates a lot to your age, to your understanding, how you grow. Uh, you can look at it professionally, like when you're working, or you can live with it. Living is really an age thing. Of course, I, I can also have some paintings, but it's, I have to get up in the morning and look at the piece, and it has to tell me everything, something new. And if I'm looking now at the younger artists, it's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think they are done also for their peers, so, uh, because that's why they're attractive. Because if you are 30, you have uh, different problems than me. Or like, no problems, but other <laughs> questions. Huh? Uh, and so when I'm walking around, uh, it's... Um, there are outstanding figures like everywhere in the world because they have already their language, they are having their program. You see with one work, sometimes with one work you don't know where it's going. Often when I'm going to the studio, I sometimes have the feeling, oh, they're doing so different things. Why they are doing so different things? What's really the case they are interested in? Because from my knowledge and also from my thing, I'm doing now books for whatever, 30, 40 years, and I'm still super interested to do it. And it's a long journey to do this. And this is like David Hockney is now 86, 87, and he's getting up every morning and, and you sit beside him and if he's drawing a kind of a, of a green, 
he sits there for two hours and doing, and he's fascinated. And then I see a blue background and it's just thing. But it, and that's the question: How? What do you ask this painting? And that's my fascination. And uh, the, the the other is the industry part. The industry part is maybe more radical in China because it, you feel much more the financial pressure or whatever. It, financially, it's also not easy to make your living in New York, but it's, it's like shareholders. So you have the art market and you have your art. This I cannot really judge here. So I feel definitely there is another financial pressure, another idea of economy, uh, which I might also have to do, but I may, might, with the different understanding of art, not this, this, all this cultural background. Yeah, because we are overloaded with our history, I think. And without our history, a lot of things you cannot understand. Yeah, you cannot, it, you, you see the silk screen painting in any wall, you see the next step from there, you see in the little things, the little mirror plates of Jeff Koons, you see the plates of Andre, Carl Andre, you see in the baskets, you see Kiki Smith's father, it's not Larry, it's not Gertrude the Smith's one, this big metal sculpture. So there's always a kind of a questioning, or you see Dali in, in the way of uh, Albert is working, or in Dali you see how he was working relating to reality with the atomic bomb, this question about the bombing and the kind of atomic idea, so the Gothic explosion painting, it's about looking. But the thing is always, and that's what me interests, uh, and that's also I learned again from David Hockney, look closer and you understand something. And it's really like seeing the different greens of the spring, it's interesting, it's really good. And uh, you learn from Van Gogh how a sunset should be. And it was the sunset of 1930 or 1920, and now you look at the sunset of David Hockney and it's the sunset from today. And I think that's what art can give us, to, to see, to look and get ways of make our own interpretation of things, or the new attempt to things. We all of a sudden see the green grass. Oh, wow. Sorry. Okay. No, I think you're exactly right. Because, exactly. Because I think, you know, obviously, in China, art has been around for dynasties, dynasties, but, you know, Chinese contemporary art has only existed for, you know, not, not that many decades ago. And that's what I think drives the you know, art industry, that, you know, that's what drives us to wake up in the morning and kind of, like, see that, you know, the artists that we work with, and you know, the art publishers that we work with, um, that drives, motivates us to do what we are doing in the industry now. And I think, um, you know, if you guys have anything to comment, I think if we're gonna wrap up for the discussion from our panelists and we're gonna open the floor up to any questions.